Good evening, Book Passage customers and viewers out there. Thank you for joining us. We have an amazing program for you tonight. My name is Cheryl Bronstein. I am one of the event coordinators here at Book Passage and just sending you a hearty welcome for this wonderful online event. Um, we have many events at Book Passage. You can find everything at bookpassage.com. That is our website. Um, thank you to our loyal customers. I know that you are all out there watching. This event will be archived. If you know people or if you don't get to watch the whole thing, no worries. You can come back to it. It'll be on our website. You can come watch it at your convenience. Tell your friends and family to check it out. It's going to be a very lively hour. And again, it's going to be archived on bookpassage.com. Um, we have lots of things going on at Book Passage. We have two locations for those of you who might be new to us. We have our store in Puerto Madera. We also have our store in the San Francisco Ferry Building. And both stores are open seven days a week. Uh, you can browse, come on in. We're, we all have very wonderful booksellers that would be more than happy to help you. You can call us on the phone or of course, order on bookpassage.com. And I'm just gonna mention a few of the events that we have on the docket. We have um, on Saturday, March 18th, we will be hosting the New York Times bestselling and beloved author, Kristen Hanna. And this event will take place at 1 p.m. in our Corte Madera store. It will also be live streamed if you can't make it in person. Kristen will be discussing her newest uh, paperback bestseller, the Four Winds. And then on Wednesday, March 22nd, we have the incredible Jacqueline Winspear in our Corte Madera store as well. And that will take place again, March 22nd, 6 p.m. And she will be presenting her newest mystery, The White Lady. So these are both in-person events and we would love for you to join us. To find out more, look at our website, bookpassage.com. We have a very active uh, winter schedule, winter and spring. Uh, we don't want you to miss anything. And we have online events. We have in-person events. We have classes, just a whole lot going on in our community. So again, take a look at our website, bookpassage.com. And here at Book Passage, our mission is to enrich, engage, and inspire. And Book Passage has been a Bay Area institution and I'm going to add a family-owned business for over 40 years. So we are grateful to our loyal supporters. Thank you for keeping our doors open. And we look forward to serving you for another 40 years. Well, despite the rain and heavy winds in Northern California, I had a wonderful morning because I was able to catch Anne Napolitano's interview with Oprah and Gail King on CBS This Morning. Now, this is the pinnacle of achievement for an author, to be interviewed by Oprah. And you did a wonderful job, and congratulations on the publication of this new book, Hello Beautiful. Adding to the honors, this is the 100th Oprah Book Club pick. She saved it, this is number 100. It is a book of the week by People Magazine, a Goodreads best book for March, a New York Times notable book, 
a very large online retailer that we shall, that shall go unnamed, but has noted that Hello Beautiful is their best book for March. And of course, a book passage favored and our recommendation for the best book club choice. Hello Beautiful is a deep family saga focusing on the bonds of sisters. It is a story of family and friendship of how people are bound to and can also set us free. Anne Napolitano is the author of Dear Edward, which was an instant New York Times bestseller, a read with Jenna selection, and has been released on Apple TV as a series. She is also the author of novels, A Good Hard Look and Within Arm's Reach. For seven years, Anne has been the associate editor of the literary magazine, One Story, and she received an MFA from New York University. Now, I had the pleasure to work with Anne when she was on book tour for Dear Edward, and I can say she is not only a talented and gifted writer, but a very generous and kind and just lovely person. And a fun fact, as a young professional, she was the personal assistant to Sting. Anne is joined this evening by Angie Kim. Angie is a Korean immigrant, former editor of the Harvard Law Review, and author of the international, international bestseller, Miracle Creek. That has been translated into over 20 languages and was named Best Book of the Year by Time, The Washington Post, Kirkus, and The Today Show. Those are all amazing achievements. She has written for the New York Times Book Review, the Washington Post, Vogue, and Glamour, among many others. Now she has a second novel titled Happiness Falls, and that is set to be published on September 26th. So we look forward to that. And of course, we hope to have an event to celebrate that book launch as well. So let's give a very warm welcome to two powerhouse authors. We are all great fans of their work. Let's give it up to Anne Montalitano and Angie Kim. Welcome to Book Passage. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Cheryl. That was so lovely. And uh, thank you so much to Book Passage. Anne, how are you feeling? I'm so excited to be here today. Congratulations and happy book birthday. Well, thank you. I'm so excited to be here with you. And I so, ooh, so appreciate you talking with me today. Thank you, Angie. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So first of all, I know that Cheryl already went over this ground, how much we all love you, but I just have to do it again um, because I just, I'm such a huge fan. Um, I wrote your New York Times book review for um, Dear Edward, and um, it was funny because I was thinking about it today, and I was actually reading over my notes um, over when I was actually reading Dear Edward for the first time. I read it when I was in Miami for the Miami Book Festival, and I actually started reading it on the plane ride there. <laughs> which was uh, which was hilarious not um but um I remember when I first got the assignment I was so nervous because you know as especially as an author I when I was like what if I don't absolutely love it you know like what what am I gonna do what would I say and then I was so relieved and I remember like in Miami being like okay I've only read like two chapters but it doesn't matter I know that I love it because I love the voices so much and mm -hmm. um and I'm so glad that I get to be a fangirl here and sort of brag about you and this amazing book which I don't really need to do because you know Cheryl did such an amazing job of it but one thing that I just loved um and I am going to talk um, ask you about Oprah very soon, um, just so people aren't like nervous that I'm not going to get to that. Um, but one thing that I loved that all of your reviews that I've read have talked about, and for example, the New York Times um, review talked about how Hello Beautiful is so radiant and beautiful, brilliantly crafted, which and that it never settles for simple answers. And I love that a lot of the reviews have focused on the complexity and sort of the darkness as well as the hope and light that's within it. Um, and I wanted to ask you about that with respect to the origin story. So um, I have read that you started writing this in April of 2020 during the pandemic, um, right after your father's death. And 
So I, I, I'm thinking that that probably had something to do with it. And I'd love to ask you about that and just tell us a little bit about how you came up with the story and what was the inspiration? Sure. I, um, well, thank you for all those kind words, Angie. I, I'm so lucky with New York Times reviews for the last two books, the amazing one that you wrote me for Dear Edward and a beautiful one that um, came out last week for Hello Beautiful. Yes. I'm very grateful. Um, so I had been thinking about the book. My general practice for the last two books is that I spend like six months to a year thinking about a book and taking notes and doing research and trying to use the sort of analytical part of my brain to figure out as much as I can before I start writing. Mm. Because when I actually start writing, the the sort of like, I, I call it like writing pretty sentences, like I like to get into like the lyricism of the language and, and it has a musicality to it in my head. And when I'm actually writing scenes, I can't think with the sort of analytical side of my brain. It's like the two don't work together. Right. So it's help, helpful for me to think analytically um, and take notes and, you know, and read for research, et cetera, before I actually start writing. So I had been doing that in the year um, prior to the pandemic starting, actually. Um, so I was really fortunate and Dear Edward came out right before the pandemic started. So I got to go on book tour for two months and then obviously everything closed down and my father who had not been well uh, died in the beginning, well, actually in the middle of April. And it was just such a weird time for everybody. Thank you. Um, but of course we couldn't, I couldn't be, we couldn't be with him while he, while he was dying. And then we didn't, weren't able to gather when he died, as happened to so many people during that period of time. Um, it's just such a strange, unusual experience to be zooming yeah. your way yeah. through your grief yeah. and also isolated in your house at the same time with your, you know, with your family. And so I, I, I write to make sense of the world too. I wonder if you feel like that as a practice for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also like a mental health thing for me. If I write, it's, it buoys me internally. So I started writing, um, cause it just felt like I had to, and also I was in my house all the time. So what else was I going to do? Yeah. And so this, this book that I had been thinking of, well, I, I had this little boy in my brain who was dribbling a basketball, um, and I had been researching basketball and the history of basketball for quite some time with some sort of like obsessive fervor that made no sense, but but told me that it belonged in my work. Right. Um, did, you, so, did you play basketball when you were like, or is it more your sons? And my sons, but really I played soccer and softball. So I was a, you know, an athletic child. Okay. okay. But not, not basketball. Um, I just became really fascinated by the history of basketball and how it mirrors sort of the the history of racism in our country yeah. um a couple of years before and there's a so I just started reading I couldn't get enough about reading nonfiction about the history of, of basketball and um you know the amazing figures within it like Bill Russell and Kareem yeah. Abdul-Jabbar and the sort of the intersections of history and the, and the history of basketball yeah. and so I started writing my way into this book with this little boy who was dribbled, who who's had had a tragedy in his family. And so he, his parents couldn't love him. And so he was very lonely. And I saw him dribbling this basketball and I kind of entered the book with this little boy. And I was lonely and sad too, because of everything that was going on and also really uncertain about you know, was, what was going to happen next? Were we going to be okay? You know, were we going to go back to quote unquote normal? Um, and so I entered on the same footing as him and like him, I was sort of magnetically drawn to these, um, vibrant sisters who showed up, the Padovano sisters, these four sisters who are incredibly close and strong-willed and they had this loving, raucous, noisy household that I could feel myself and William sort of pressed up against the window being like, we want to be in there. Yeah. And well I, I mean, did That's they, so where did they come from? So did you have them when you were thinking about the book in your analytical pre-writing phase, yeah. did, were they there all along? And did you know that they were going to be sort of like the contemporary counterparts to the little women or did that come later? Yeah, that came later. I knew that okay. he was going to, 
get involved with a girl named Julia Padovano. And I knew okay. that she had a sister. I knew she had at least one sister. Okay. And when I was in the book, I was like, oh, there's four sisters. Uh, and, and then the, the, in the book, the four sisters are in conversation in one scene and they are comparing each other to the four sisters from Little Women. And when they did that, I was like, oh yeah, of course. Like that okay. makes sense. Like, yeah, that, that totally I, makes sense. I, I recently yeah. watched the movie, The Little Women, you know, the the remake. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I just watched it like last month and I don't know where I was when it came out, but that I didn't watch it because it's one of my favorite books. But um, but then of course I was like, oh, I wonder if like Anne watched that while, you know, when it when you were actually writing it. Yeah, no, it's one of my family's favorite movies. We watched it was actually the last movie that my two sons and husband and I watched in a movie theater before the pandemic. Oh, um, and obviously, and I loved Little Women as a child, um, but it was not in my mind until the four characters started talking about it. And then I was like, okay, I totally see, like, I see what's going, you know, I see the possibilities here. I see why they're comparing themselves with Joe. Um, it raises the question of who's Beth and, you know, yeah. all these things exactly. sort of arrive from that but if that was not from my analytical brain actually um I I just love that so much. wait do you have uh do you come from a, a family of sisters like a big family of sisters or anything like that I have a brother and a sister and a half sister um okay. but really my best friend who lived down the street from me uh Leah her mother had has six sisters and I used to sleep at Leah's house all the time and these six sisters would just come in and out of the house like like they lived there oh, yeah. and they all had like slightly different versions of the same face yeah. and they seemed more themselves when they were together in a room than when they were apart and I was completely fascinated by these six women who just sort of like you know seemed like different pieces of a jigsaw puzzle that fit when they were together um, yeah, I, and so really yeah. With them yeah no I love that I'm an only child myself and um and so I loved the idea of like big families so when I read about this I I felt a little bit like William like I was like yeah I'm like this kid that doesn't know I mean I I wasn't in a loveless family my parents were very loving but but still you know I didn't have this like raucous noisy you know sisterly kind of thing and I like fell found myself so drawn and also the other thing is, you know, I don't know if you feel this way with two boys, but I have three boys and there's a part of me that kind of always wanted a girl so I could, you know, like read Little Women with her and, and, and of Green Gables and, you know, things like that. So it was, I, I sort of like found myself longing for this family and just sort of falling in as I was reading your book and, and just wishing that it would just kind of keep on going forever and not stop, you know, which is the best kind of feeling, I think. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Well, I wanted to be with them too. Yeah. Um, and I wrote this book faster than anything that I've written before. I wrote it in two years, oh. which for me is like lightning. Like a Dear Edward took eight years and the book before that took seven or eight years. So this was, it was like, I dove into this book and it just like grabbed me right. and it like it just poured out and I felt like feverish with it. And the only resolution to that was to like, to get it right and to, yeah. you know, keep working and working until like, I felt like I did justice to the characters that were in the book. Um, I, and yeah. I had, I had to really it was going to be all right. And I, I actually, I didn't know if he was or not. So that also similar for dear Edward I didn't know if Edward was going to be all right in the book right. yeah that was where I had to feel my way through and it was a yeah. similar sensation in this book yeah I feel the same way when I start writing no matter how much thinking I do about something a story whether it be you know a book of course I've only like written two but whatever um but you know or a short story that I never can figure out what's going to happen in the end or what the answer is or anything like that. So that that's comforting to me that you feel the same way too, especially since I feel like the endings of your books, um, I've read all of them, ha are just so like perfect and it seems like it kind of fits and 
is inevitable in a way that, you know, like you come to it and you're just like, well, of course that was meant to be, uh, which is, you know, so it, it makes me feel like you knew all along, you know? So that's great that's nice. that, yeah, it's interesting. That and more, I marvel at writers that do know what the ending is because like in a way I'm like I don't understand what they're writing towards like if I knew how it ended then like in a way I'd be like well I don't have to write the book exactly no th that that's exactly what I say to myself I was like you know what I like that I actually don't know the ending because that's the impetus that's the motivation for me to actually go to my writing desk and actually write because I'm telling myself well if you actually keep on writing you might actually find out what happens to these characters at the end of the story whenever that is yeah. three, four years from like now. It's like personally, personally satisfying, even if, exactly. you know, that is, I agree. Exactly. Um, I don't know yeah. some other satisfaction that writers get who know the ending, but it's, it's, um, it's interesting to me. Yeah, no, I think it would be, I think it would be very fascinating to actually know what you're writing towards. It would be, yeah. it, would, it would certainly get rid of a lot of the anxiety that I have on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, totally. That also is what drives me through the book is like, is, can I make this work? I have no idea. What if I can't? Oh my God, I have to try again today. You what know, if you to can't? If and then do. you have to like start over from begin. Oh, that would, let's not, not even talk about that. That's just horrible. <laughs> That's just horrifying as I'm starting my third novel right now. Okay. But let's, uh, let's get back to your novel. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit um, about family. Um, because so many, again, of your amazing reviews have highlighted the, the family aspect of it. And, you know, obviously the book is about families, but not just families, but like, you know, um, in Booklist, which gave you a starred review, they said um, they talked about it as the deep, maddeningly frustrating and ever present love of family, whether tied by genetics or by choice, which I thought was such a great way of putting it. And, um, and the large behemoth, you know, like online retailer that shall be not be named right now. <laughs> um, they talked about those, it's a story of family, the ones we're born into, the ones we marry into, and the ones we make, and the fractured relationships. And the Washington Post also in their amazing review said that Anna Napolitano catalogs the multitudes of love and hurt that families contain and lays bare their powers to both damage and heal. And that's exactly what I thought. I thought after, after I finished your book, I remember I was trying to sort of uh, um, write down what I thought about it. And I thought, you know, it's about the power to wound and the incredible, like incredibly deep wounds that though you know our parents especially can can inflict on us but and mm -hmm. also then of course on the other side the incredible power to heal and come together and you know forgive and things like that um just talk a little bit about you know family and the kinds of family relationships that you know you have sort of witnessed or been part of that have like sort of fed into your stories because you had similar things of course going on with dear edward too yeah i think it's more that i'm interested in love and um not very much not just romantic love but like all the different ways that we have responsibility for each other that we turn towards each other and care for each other or don't and the power, like you said, that parents have over children, like the the first line of Hello Beautiful, um, God, I should know this by heart at this point, but it, um, it like it, the ramifications of this one line go through the rest of the book. Um, for the first six days of William Waters' life, he was not an only child. Yeah. And that fact, which he has no control over, he's literally a newborn when his three-year-old sister dies, um, affects the rest of his life in these inc yeah. incredibly myriad ways. And it also affects the lives of the four Padovano sisters who live a thousand miles away from where he was born yeah. and have nothing to do with his parents. And so that is always fascinating to me. Yeah. Um, and in the cycles that happen within families where um, William's parents turned away from him. And then later in the book, he actually turns away from family himself. Mm -hmm. um, I, I 
I can't say who because it's a spoiler. Yeah, 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 but you can't do spoilers. Yeah, people. It's the first day of the book's release. People, most people have not read it yet. Exactly. Um, but he repeats in a way his parents, um, you know, fault or mistake. And the same thing happens in the Padovano family. Um, the four girls' mother, Rose. Um, I don't think this is like she she had a child before she got married or she got yeah. pregnant before she got married with the oldest yeah. girl, Julia. Yeah. yeah. And she does not want that for her children. And one of her daughters does get pregnant and her Rose's mother cut her off and and she does the same thing to her daughter. So like that's fascinating to me that yeah. the sort of the the fault lines that run through a family that continue into the next generation, even with people being very aware of where those fault lines are. Yeah, I was going to say, even when they are specifically trying not to repeat the same mistakes, and yet they do yeah. it, and it's almost like they can't control themselves because yeah. they know about it. They know it, they recognize yeah. it, they're being told about it, and yet they can't. And what's great, I think, about some about your novel and your writing is that you um, give us access into the sort of psyches of these characters, such that we actually empathize with them. Well, maybe not the mom. I don't know. I, I'm still very upset with her. So, but um, but that we we understand what what they're going through, and I think that takes a lot. Um, and that's actually, I think, the power of literature, right? Is that it makes us empathize with things that we normally, if we didn't have access to the deep thoughts, that we wouldn't necessarily have. Yeah. I think that's true. And that's that's part of one of the things that just always fascinates me is, you know, someone does something that's quote unquote terrible. Yeah. But if you look at, um, actually, <laughs> I just listened to recently, uh, Oprah and a, uh, a doctor of trauma had a book that came out a couple of years ago called What Happened to You. And they say in the book that everything would change if we said to some, when someone acted out or behaved badly or had a breakdown, if you said to them, what happened to you instead of what's wrong with you? Mm, because yeah. we're set up to look, like, look at a child who's yeah. flailing and, and, you know, acting out and we're like, what's wrong with you? Yeah. But no, what happened to you? Yeah. And that's yeah. so, there's so much more compassion baked into oh, that question. I love that. Yeah. That's so wonderful. That's such a yeah. great and I think that's that's what happens in fiction with the so-called unlikable characters that we sometimes talk about, which I hate. Um, I've done several, I've I've done so many of these panels about you know like unlikable characters and why are you a character so unlikable and why can't they just be nice and think nice thoughts and you know and you're just like you know that's one of the things about you know literary stories it's that you are actually trying to figure out and trying to expose some of these very shameful thoughts that we all have and some of the yeah. shameful actions that we all take. And yeah. well, not uh, some, some people are very good, but, but in, it, still like at least the shameful thoughts. And, yeah. you know, and we're trying to normalize that and make people realize that we do all feel that way. So it's not, and, and I, I, I really don't like when people don't, um, when people, when readers can't seem to differentiate between, you know, the things that people think and the things that they do and the things that characters think and the things that the authors actually think too, you know, so. I agree. I agree. And I guess the unlikable character thing kind of drives me crazy because it is that if, if you went into any of our heads, you're going to find that, you know, we're quote unquote unlikable at least, yeah. you know, 25% of the time. And also, and then it's a question of, it is really like, do you understand why the person is doing what they're doing? Like what happened to them? What led them to behave the way that they are? Like, like you know, that is so much more important to me than, um, you know, putting them in a box and saying, you know, this is a bad person. This is a good person. I like this person. I don't like that person is too judgmental and limiting, I think, you know, certainly within literature, but also, you know, in yeah. our day-to-day -day lives. Too. Definitely. Um, okay, so one thing, okay, I'm going to ask you about Oprah, finally, because we're now like 30 minutes in, and, you know, 
Um, so I have to ask you, um, but in the context of your whole journey of being a writer, the New York Times um, did, you know, uh, an article, um, I, I think it came out today, the one about Oprah, I guess it would, would, would have yeah, happened today. <laughs> and um, I was, it's funny, because I was just at AWP um, all this last weekend, and I actually was on a panel about, public, you know, giving advice about publishing and things like that. And there were so many people in the audience who were like, you know, writers who are writing and writing, and but they haven't had success yet. And they were asking about how to get an agent, how to get a, a publishing deal and things like that. And so having thought a lot about that and then reading about your story, it just gave so much hope to, I think, the rest of us that, you know, you had two books that didn't, weren't like huge bestsellers. And, you know, and then you had like this amazing breakout novel and then like this one again. And I, I guess I just wanted to ask about sort of persistence and, you know, whether you feel like there's anything different in the way that you approach these last two books versus the first two. Like, is there anything like of a lesson learned that you can you know give to the rest of us that we can all pass along to the hopeful authors out there i wish i mean i think i'm just a very slow <laughs> learner and a slow de developer because i wrote two books in my 20s that didn't sell at all like i couldn't get an agent with the first one the second one i got an agent but it didn't sell to a publisher i didn't publish anything until i was 31 and that was my first no novel and the two novels that I wrote in my 30s, um, you know, they did okay and they got some nice reviews, but they didn't sell very much at all. And when I started writing Dear Edward, I really thought that I probably wouldn't be able to publish it because I was at that point what, you know, at least used to be called a mid-list write writer That's, where yeah. I was, where I'm in the middle of my career. I'm not a young, exciting debut. My books have not been selling well. So like, you're not a good investment for a publisher. <laughs> so it took me eight years to write Dear Edward in part because I was like in no hurry because I was like, it's not, you know, I'm doing this for myself and to write right. this book. I love writing and that I am like, and I think probably maybe that's the part of the distinction was that at that point, I I had no, um, almost no aspiration for publishing because I didn't think it was going to happen or I thought if it did happen, it was a very quiet affair that didn't really change my life much. So I might as well enjoy writing this book as much as I could. And I really did like I, Dear Edward is ostensibly a very sad book, but I actually really <laughs> loved writing it. It was very joyful when I was inside of it. Yeah. Um, and then, and then I think, you know, I'm 51 now. So, you know, if it, it's not like I was a quick success in any, you know, by any any chron chronology that you want to choose. But that's what's so inspiring about it is that you kept going and you're not, you know, I mean, no offense to the 20 year old, you know, like overnight successes out there or anything like that, you know, God love them. But, but no, totally. But that's what makes it so inspiring is that you, this isn't your, you know, like for Dear Edward wasn't your debut and you know, and, um, and you kept going. So it's like sort of gives hope. And, and I agree with you that it's not a sad novel. In fact, I actually had um, a paragraph in my, uh, in my book, in my review that um, what had to be cut for length, because I gave them like way, way more than they asked for. Because <laughs> I was like, I, I can't, I need to justice to the book, where I said, like, I just, I, I think that some people are going to categorize this as a sad, depressing book. I'm like worried that it's going to be that some pe some reviewers are going to say that, but it's not. It's so full of hope and it's about sort of resilience and it's about overcoming, which is, you know, so which is what we need, right? We need conflict in order to get to the, the amazing bit at the end. And it's that journey and, you know, and I feel like it's the same thing here. There are definitely things that, you know, you wouldn't want to happen to your, you know, best friends that would hurt your heart to like happen to you. But what's amazing about it is that it is about the family bonds that sort of 
you know, are that won't go away no matter what, you know, that survive and that mend and that heal. Um, and that's what's like just so affirming about it. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, if I, I think for the young writers, I, I do think stubbornness is a very valuable trait as a writer. I mean, also called persistence. Um, but I just think if you can, you know, get knocked down and stand up again and then get knocked down and stand up again and keep going and you keep going because you value and feel like you're growing inside of the work, even if you're just growing, you know, as a human, um, I, like I said, I make sense of the world through my writing. And I feel like a lot of my understanding of what I think about like love and family and um, parenting, et cetera, like I, the tentacles of it appear are in my work and I follow them along and I learn things as I go. So as long as, it, you know, there's a cliche that you focus on the process, but really if you can focus on the process and sort of, you know, cry for a couple of days when something doesn't work out and then keep going, it's really, um, the long game is a really satisfying, enriching one. You know, yeah. even, even if you don't, you know, get to talk to Oprah, it's, um, <laughs> it, uh, it's so, I'm so glad that I kept going. Yeah. Well, and also, I mean, I love hearing the stories about you and Hannah Tinty and your, um, your other, um, um, writing partner. I mean, I just, I love the group. Um, camaraderie, the right, because, you know, writing can be so lonely, I think. Um, and, and I love your role in one story. Um, because I mean, one story is like, was my favorite. Um, you know, I have like a whole closet full of one stories, like, you know, this high. And I just, I, I love that so much. So I just love that. Um, I love that even though, even when your books weren't selling in your, you know, 20s and 30s or whatever, that you were, you know, in this literary community where, you know, you were learning from each other and you were sort of growing together. Um, so that seems really special to me. How did, how did that group um, function for this particular book? I'd love to know. And uh, Cheryl was asking about this too. Do you, do you have a close group of writer friends that you can bounce ideas off of? She just, she just um, put in the chat. Yeah. So I went to NYU for the MFA program when I was, I don't know, 22 or 23 or something shortly after college. Um, and in one of the workshops, I sat with Hannah Tinty and Helen Ellis that are two amazing writers um, Hannah Tinty wrote a novel that's amazing and everyone should read it called The Twelve Lives of Samuel Hawley that came out uh, four years ago, maybe. Yeah. Spectacular. And Han uh, Helen has a book of essays that is coming out in June, which is so funny. Um, it's called Kiss Me in the Coral Lounge. Um, she writes humorous essays that are like deep and moving and hilariously funny. Um, so we were very different, actually. The three of us are really different, but we started meeting outside of class in graduate school um, and workshopping each other's work. And we've been doing that for the last, I well, I can't really do math, but like 26, 27 years or something like that. Right. Um, yeah. And so we're each other's first readers and extremely close friends and supporters. And we also have really high standards for each other. So like I, you know, we read each other's work and we're like, this could be better. You know, it's yeah. not about telling each other how amazing we are all yeah. the time. Um, and for this book, as, as I've gone on, um, I try to give them as little, I try to only use them when I need to. So it's a lot of giving them pages in the first 150 pages of the book. Okay. But I really don't know what I'm doing yet. And I'm yeah. not sure what, really not sure what works and what doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. And then their input is invaluable. Um, so they get me at the phase that I think of as like, they're the people that I'm comfortable ugly crying in front of. Yes. Yes. Cause like what I, what I give them is like embarrassingly bad, yeah. you know, like I wouldn't want to show it to anybody else, you right. know, like, so that's the ugly crying version of, you know, I wouldn't want my agent to see how horrible what I'm no, writing at yes. that point. No, I know. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And they're, you know, both kind and honest with me and, 
um, they each have really different sort of viewpoints. So if they both agree on something, I know it's right. Like I'll, they'll be like, if they both want me to cut something, it's gone. And yeah. then if they both disagree, which is more of the time, then yeah. I see, you know, that I can be like, you know, which one resonates with me. Um, but they're so important to my life and my work. And I, I'm really, really grateful for our relationship. Oh, that's so wonderful. I love that. I, I love that. Um, I saw Hannah Tinti's um, social media post um, talking about this book and it was just so heartwarming and so wonderful. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, a couple of questions, I'm getting them from other people. So I have to ask, okay, I'm going to ask this because I want to know this too. I was going to ask you about POV, but you know what? We'll come back to it if we can. Um, Cheryl asks, and I want to know this too, such a colorful and in interesting cover. Did you have input into the book jacket? Tell us the story of the book jacket, the cover. It's just so beautiful. It is so beautiful. I have it yourself. It up, so yeah, oh, so gorgeous. Oh my God. Um, yeah. No, I have, I have no, I mean, I don't know what your experience is with covers, but I generally like in my experience, I get shown something and I have veto power basically. So if I don't right. like it, then it's, yeah. then it's not the cover, yeah. Yeah. but uh, it's not, like, it's not like I have a hand in designing the cover. Although yeah. in this, this book, my editor had had the idea of having it be a, a painting of a woman's face because one of the sisters in the book, Cecilia is a painter and she right. paints women's faces. Right. onto the walls in right. uh, the neighborhood in Chicago that they live in. Yeah. So that made a lot of sense. And my input was to say that I thought that she should, the woman should be looking straight at you and that okay. she shouldn't look, she shouldn't look pretty or sexy or sad. She should be looking like strong and straightforward and forthright, like just okay. bare honesty. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then they, the, a wonderful artist named Jessica Miller um, painted this for the art department, um, oh, you know, in response. Painted, so it's not like they found it. She actually painted it. Wow. Yeah. This, this is the style of, um, you know, of portraits that she, do, that she does. So oh, wow. I think they thought that she would be a good match for this. Um, and, wow. and she was. So they showed me like, like eight possible women's faces, not only one by Jessica, um, but by other artists um, that already existed, I think, actually, the other ones. Like, I think they found them, you know, and were like, we could do something like this. And this was the clear, uh, immediately, I was like, oh, my God, I'd be thrilled if this is the cover. Oh, my God, so that's I amazing. Really yeah. Oh, that's so great. I love that. Um, okay, so another question from Cheryl, again. Oh, no, it's okay. Were your children impressed that you met Oprah? I totally have this question too. Because I read in I read in the New York Times today that your children, your sons, you were not you didn't tell them you couldn't tell them about Oprah. Like even though you talked to her five, you found out that you were a pick for like five months and you couldn't say anything to your own children. Yeah, well, I had to, I had to sign an NDA, like a non-disclosure agreement, yeah, and yeah. it was very serious. Like they, they were like, seriously, like you can't leak, this cannot leak. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, obviously I, I told my husband, yeah. um, but I didn't, you know, you have sons, like my sons are 13 and 15, no, their absolutely. impulse control, there's terrible. no way. like, yeah, so no, no. there's no, no way. I don't no, think they, it's just, it's not even like it's that interesting to them. Like they think I told them like on Friday <laughs> and if they're like, oh, cool. You know, like they think it's cool. They they know who Oprah is, although they, they don't do. obviously understand. Okay, well, that's good. That's a start. You not think your sons would know who Oprah is? I don't think so. I told them about it at dinner right now. Like, you know, we were having dinner right before we came up and I was like, well, this is what I'm doing. This is so cool. And like this woman that I'm interviewing, remember the, that's the woman who's like book that I did the New York Times book review over. And they're like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And I said, and she's an Oprah book club. And they're like, uh-huh, that seems good. You're like, who, who is this? But like, <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. But my boys did know who she is, but they were just, you know, like, they're like, yeah, that's cool, mom. But like, yeah. I did, I could not, my, my 15 year old would not have been able to like, at some point he just would have told like six people oh, just because he was bored. He 
Yeah, of yeah. course. Or like, you would they were like on his, like on Snapchat and been like, right. well, it's just a snap. Like it'll disappear. Yeah, exactly. They're like the last people I would have told is basically the truth of the matter. Yeah. And they were. <laughs> I love that. That's so cool. Were they impressed that you were on TV though? Um, again, they're like, cool. You know, I think kind of. Okay. <laughs> In the meantime, your agent and your editor are like crying and, you know. Oh, yeah, exactly. I love exactly. that. Exactly, no. Oh, Nor do um, I expect okay. All right. Um, okay, so from Megan, we, in the audience, we have a question. We have, how did it come about to have Maura Tierney read the audiobook? Such a great choice. Okay, so I have not listened to the audiobook, but, I, but Maura Tierney, I can see, would be amazing. So yeah, cool. I'm, I'm really... Yeah, I actually didn't hear it or hear any of it until today because um, it. I think she just did. She just recorded it, you know, in February. I've lost all track of time. Oh, that was a month ago. What, yeah, what, so last yeah, month. What month is it right now? Okay, it's March. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's March. March. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it was just recorded last month. Um, so I, they were produ You know, in so I I heard none of it until today, and like actually this morning I went to like the behemoth site that should not be named to listen to yeah. a sample. <laughs> like you can listen to them. and I downloaded it from Libro, Libro FM, which is where I listen to all of yes, my audiobooks. Me too. Me too. A great, great uh, audiobook website. Um, and I listened to the first chapter, and I I love it, and I really like her. I watched news radio when I was whatever age I was when news also, radio came and on, and also ER. Do you remember when she and was ER, on ER? Yeah. 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 That's, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. So actually. I really do like, I, I was very happy with how it sounds and everything. So exciting. Yeah. But I mean, actually, you know what, then that brings us back to the whole POV thing, um, which I okay. want to talk to you about anyway. Um, so your New York Times book review does talk about the POV, which I was really thrilled about um, him really thinking about that, not only for this novel, but for your previous novels too. Um, and POV is something that I like teach and about and I and that I'm really, really geek out over. Um, so yeah, so tell me about the POV and the voice, um, the voices, uh, you know, for, for this particular book and for just in general for your all of your novels. Um, uh, you know, just the the decision. Uh, do you make that decision early on? Like, does that come about through free writing? Is that part of your analytical mindset that you sort of think like, okay, like you know, I need to have these voices, and you know, I need to sort of develop them. How does that come about? Yeah, I mean, I love POV too. What I really love is going into different people's heads. Like I would say that that's like a strength and a weakness of mine. Like my inclination is to basically go into like as many heads as I possibly can. Exactly, exactly, me yeah. too. Yeah, and then people are like, rein it in, rein it in, you know. I know. <laughs> like it's, I know. End up going into too, too many heads. Yeah. Um, but I, that's part of what I love about writing. And I really love um, just adopting the mindset of a completely different person um, like in Dear Dear Edward, it was like a gift that I had, you know, half the book was on a plane and like yes. everyone flies basically. Yeah. So yeah. I got to go in the heads of people who are so wildly different from each other. Whereas if you're writing like a domestic drama on a cul-de-sac, you're very limited, you know, by who's on that yeah. cul-de-sac. Um, so really it's just like a geeky thing that I absolutely love to do. Um, and for Hello Beautiful, it's a feel like it ends up being a feel thing. Like, obviously I knew the first chapter is going to be William. And then I knew that Julia was the important sister. And then I was like, Oh, I also need to go into Sylvie's head. Yeah. Um, but, but there are characters heads who I went into who my agent and editor were like, no, 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 you can't go into their heads too. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, so interesting. Oh, I love that. I went, I went into Rose's, the mother's head. Uh, yeah. She had like, chapter or two and then I also went into Izzy who is uh one of the next yeah. generation um, yeah. 
little girls. They had a chapter from her point of view too. So sometimes actually, I think it's a great exercise as the writer, because you find out, you know, you do learn it's world building. Even if you don't end up doing that, you learn something about those characters or their backstory that you wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to figure out otherwise. Yeah. Um, But generally it's a big weakness of mine. No, strength. absolutely. I feel the same way. Um, for my debut, I had seven POV, you know, car- yeah. uh, uh, that I bounced back and forth, mostly in close third, although one in first. And in this one, the one that I just finished writing that's coming out, it's one mm-hmm. character's POV in first person the entire mm-hmm. way through. And I have oh. to tell you, it was so hard for me. I was I've like... I've never done it. I mean, okay. The only reason I did it is because I was like, almost like to the point of stubbornness. I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it by God, you know, if it kills me kind of thing, because it was so hard because, you know, scene ends and I would be wondering like, huh, I wonder what's going on with this person or like that person. And it would have been so easy to just like go into somebody else's head. And, and also just from like, um, a momentum perspective too, like, you know, just to sort of go to somebody else's life and pick up on what's important in the story, rather than just following one character throughout. Like, seriously, there were times when I was like, I don't know what I'm going to have this character do. Like, what could she possibly do now? Like, she's going to sleep. Did you feel like it was important to the story itself that it be contained within I don't One think so. I think it probably would have been fine to be with other. It's just partly I was kind of in love with her and her voice. So I wanted to stay with it. And also I wanted to, it was kind of a challenge to myself, like, you know, to grow as a writer, like I might as well, like, you know, I might, I'd like to do something that's different and I don't want to do the same thing. And so, so I did it that way, but I really regretted it a lot. And like, I would be calling my editor and being like, what do you think? Like, do you think it would be okay if, like, I did a multiple POV? And he'd be like, yeah, try it. And I'd be like, nah, okay, yeah. <laughs> so. I hear your restraint. I have not even attempted that yet. Uh, I just love changing try places. It. Try it, try it. And then, like, and then email, like, we can, we can message each other. And I can see. I see thinking, like, thinking about it makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> I know exactly right but that's one of the reasons I'm I'm ne- I don't think I'm ever going to do this again though however you know like I like I've done it it's one of these things it's like climbing a mountain or whatever it's like I've done it I've conquered it well no I haven't conquered it but you know what I mean I've tried to conquer it now I can go away so um okay so we have another question and by the way for the audience out there you should feel free to ask questions um uh and I see that you guys are doing that anyway but that's great um okay so we have another question Apple TV picked up Dear Edward are you in conversations with any networks for Hello Beautiful and also just tell us about the whole you know like Dear Edward and the whole TV thing and and how it was to like go on the set and you know all that kind of stuff all that fun stuff we want to know Um, I think Hello Beautiful is going to be adapted. Um, it's very close to, you know, having a deal to become, I think, a television show. Okay. Uh, so we'll see. Okay. Who knows? Um, I mean, the thing with things being optioned and made is that, like, they almost never go all the way through and happen. And it was, like, miraculous that Dear Edward um, yeah. did that in a yeah. what is for, you know, Hollywood an incredibly short amount of time. Um, so great. I know, I know. I'm so I'm very, very lucky. So I met with Jason Kadams, who's the showrunner and writer for Friday Night Lights and Parenthood in February 2020. And he wanted to option the book for Apple. And I really respect him as a writer and yeah. a creator. So I was like, great. And writers have different, you know, ways that they want to be involved or not involved with, yeah. you know, some, some writers like to write their shows or they like to be one of the writers or some of them are showrunners, yeah. which is like the whole jabang. Yeah. Um, I don't want anything to do with it personally. Cause <laughs> I mean, up until now, like who knows, never say never, but yeah. I, I love to write novels. So I don't want to 
write the Dear Edward television show. Also, I would have no idea how to do so. And I would need a lot of help because that's yeah. not in my, I, you know, I've never done that before. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, I was really happy to completely hand it over to Jason Kadams. I knew that he wanted to change things and, you know, reimagine it in his own vision. And I was yeah. like, great, totally fine with that. Like, I'm interested to see what you do. I'm curious. Yeah. And um, I read I read the pilot and I was like, wow, this is different, but like, right. cool yeah. and beautifully written. And then like a year later, they were shooting and um, they, shoot, they shot most of it in New York and Queens. Um, they had a sound stage in Queens that they brought in like a complete airplane, like yeah. in parts oh, so that they could reconstruct it for the crash, which is like crazy stuff like that, that you're like, oh my God. And there was a field in upstate New York where they had the debris of the plane and, you know, that the looked like the crash. Um, it was a, you know, obviously it's a big production, which is crazy, yeah. you know, like when you're this thing that's in your head and then it becomes this physical manifestation with like, you know, hundreds of employees and cast and everything. And so they were shooting in Central Park and uh, my agent and I went to watch uh, an afternoon of filming. Aww. And it was, I, the, the wildest thing was that I met the little boy who plays Edward. And when he was walking towards me, um, like I almost started crying because it was like, oh. that was this little boy that like yeah. has lived in my heart for yeah. like eight years while I was writing it, who I love so deeply. Yeah. <laughs> and it was so, it was so moving to see him in a physical 3D form. Did um, he seem kind of like what you imagined he would you know what I mean well I don't know how well you picture your characters in your head in some ways they're kind of vague to me like right. they're not sharp you know right. physically right. I mean you know them completely but like that it's in a it's a slightly amorphous thing yeah. so like there's I didn't I didn't picture him having like curly hair which this little boy does but like yeah. the this the spirit of him feels exactly right exactly. like he's a kind it's of yeah it's the Im amorphous spirit like it's like you you feel like you would know them even if they don't yeah. look yes like yeah like yeah. I feel like that, that little boy is dear to me even though yeah. if I didn't know that he was yeah. Edward it was very moving oh, yeah and then it's very, very exciting to have it come out um I went to the premiere in LA which was crazy I mean for yeah. <laughs> it's just because you're just like I'm a writer who stays in a room most of the time wearing sweatpants and you know it was a really wonderful life experience and um you know I'm very grateful so cool um well Cheryl I see you so I think this means that our time is coming to an end sadly it is um I want to ask Anne though um do you have the uh portrait like do you have that in your house that she painted yes. yeah no, I don't have the portrait. I have, she, she made me a little, it's right here, uh, like a little drawing of the oh, face. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay, that's um, beautiful. But I would I've want made the, a little, I would want the actual painting. Cheryl, great idea. Like, I would want the painting. I know, actually, I've thought about that. I, I should probably see if I can buy that from her. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, you're right. Okay, everyone, the book. Hello, beautiful. It is Oprah's 100th book pick. And again, as we've heard in this last hour, it is getting rave reviews. It came out today. We congratulate Anne. Um, this is a great book for, uh, you know, if you're traveling, if you are, you need to be, pick a book for your book club, uh, fa family members. It's just such a wonderful story. It's got so many different layers and um, you're going to truly enjoy it. And again, let's keep in mind that Angie's new book, uh, Happiness Falls, that is going to be out September 26th. We hope to have an event with her at that time. Um, we have that book will be available at Book Passage when it comes out. And right now, this is on our shelves. Let me get it. Uh, I'm, on, I'm on a screen. Oh, there we wow. go. There we go. Uh, we have uh, Dear Edward is also available as well as Hello Beautiful. They are available at Book Passage and other independent bookstores. Remember, these are wonderful free events that we can provide to our community. And we can do it because you buy your books at Book Passage. 
Again, thank you so much for watching. You can let your friends and family know this event will be archived. Uh, you can watch it again at a later date at your convenience. I want to thank Angie for helping us out tonight. And of course, Anne, congratulations. Anne Napolitano, always a pleasure to see you. We're very proud of you. Congratulations on the wonderful reviews this book is getting. Uh, we look forward to having it in our stores and selling it to all of our patrons. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Have a good evening. Thank you.